Hey, man, I love that part of that bumper where it says, until he returns. That's one of my favorite parts, that whole bumper. Uh, you can begin turning to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9. Uh, if you do not have a pew back in front of you, we actually now, we were not able to reorder the, the existing pew back Bible. So we actually have two types that are out there. Now, I mean, they're both in a, a, a New American Standard 95 edition. However, as a result, the page numbers don't don't match anymore. So that's why I've stopped saying the page numbers. Uh, but you can turn to the book of Revelation, which if you're not familiar, it's the very, very last book of the Bible. Uh, so go to the very far right, go there, go to the ninth chapter. Uh, and those are the big numbers. And then the verses are the little numbers beside each paragraph. And uh, that's where we're going to be, chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 12 uh, this morning in that location when we finally get to that location. And if you do not own a Bible, we'd love for you to take that Bible with you as a gift from us because we want everybody reading the Word of God. Now, uh, before we actually start to jump into that, uh, I, I, I got to tell you, I was in the back running the live sound and stuff, and, and so I didn't actually hear all of the announcements very clearly because of what I was doing back there. Uh, but I, I do want to emphasize in, on the back side of that, that uh, sermon, um, sli sermon slide, fill in the blank, on the back side of it, there's an advertisement for a mobile dental unit. And... Um, the reason why I'm emphasizing this or really kind of mention this to you at this particular point is because that is something, uh, that how we kind of got involved with this is Advent Health, uh, specifically the emergency room at Sebring, started receiving a whole lot of uh, um, ER visits with people dealing with dental issues. And they actually started looking for um, Organizations they did not they did not know about Florida Baptist at that point they started looking for organizations that had mobile dental units and they actually found that the Florida Baptist Convention actually does have a have a mobile dental unit uh, to help minister to those who um, may 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 not be able to have have insurance or economic situations that don't allow them to go to a regular dentist or job situations that don't allow them to go to a regular dentist. So as a result of that. They contacted the Florida Baptist Convention, who then contacted us and said, hey, we would like to do a mobile dental unit in the month of November here at First Baptist Church of Bowling Green. And so we have already uh, met with Advent Health, and we were like, yeah, let's do this. We've already brought Mark Johnston, who is with the Florida Baptist Convention, down here to talk with us a little bit about it. And so the reason why I'm sharing this with you is it is going to take most of us to help volunteer. It will be the week of November the 4th. It is a week-long kind of ordeal, because think of it like VBS. Uh, and, and for those of you that do not actually have jobs, this would be a fantastic opportunity for you to assist us in this during some of those hours. Those that you have, other, have jobs, you can assist us more in the evenings. But the point being is we are going to need some teams. Like we're going to need people that actually uh, kind of help our, like a greeter team. We're going to need those that would be like helping like with the food for those that are the actual workers. Uh, we're going to need those going to help with some administrative type things that help actually do some screening. And there's some training for that, how to actually take individuals through screening uh, and so forth. Uh, the point being though is we are, we've got multiple teams that are going to be involved. Uh, we're going to have, a, we need an evangelistic team uh, because obviously part of the whole point is, yes, we're meeting a physical need of these individuals, but we're hoping that through the conversations we have, as we're being hospitable and genuine, that we can then also share Jesus. Amazing concept. So we need like an evangelism type team of those who are intentionally looking for those opportunities and conversations to share the gospel. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is because you are going to be being asked, many of you are going to be, I mean, uh, hopefully all of you are going to be asked, but I've told Dina Patterson, Dina, please stand up so everybody can actually see you because maybe not everybody knows you. So yes, please ex wave, wave at everybody, wave everybody. This is Dina. Dina Patterson. Her husband, Jerry, uh, abandoned us today because he works for Mosaic, and, uh, and every other week he's not here, but her, her husband is the guy with the big burly beard that you all see on stage uh, every, other, every other Sunday, um, and, and they've been in our church for over a year now, and so, and uh, she is actually going to be our director for this. And so she is being tasked with responsibility of coming to you and talking with you. And so when Dina comes up and says to, Hey, I, we really need you to, to serve in this capacity. I don't want you to go, who are you? And why are you talking to me? Okay. 
and 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 by the way, I'm gonna, you've already you've already prayed about it, and the answer is yes. Okay, because this is an opportunity, a very real, tangible opportunity for our church to meet needs within this community and to share the gospel. So when she asks, you just say, "Where do you need me?" That's your response. November 4th, and it's through, that's where we kind of need to, we have to work through once we do some of our on-screening. It could go through Saturday morning or just through Friday night. That depends on the needs that we see of how many needs there are. If we need a morning session on Saturday, then we'll have a morning session on Saturday. But we have to be done by 1 p.m. on Saturday because they got to take that mobile bus and go get it refitted for the very next week because they, they, we, they do like, they do something like 45 to 48 of these mobile dental units every year in the state of Florida. So what happens on Saturday evening, they grab that bus, they take it back, they restock it, refill it, get it resupplied, and then they got to drive it. And obviously, as you all know, the state of Florida is a very, very large state. So it is, you, if, you're, if you're from the panhandle all the way down to the Keys, there's a lot of territory to be dri uh, driven in that, in that location. So just be aware of that, and I wanted you guys to be uh, uh, aware of the mobile dental unit. All right, one more thing that I need to address. Now we are in the book of Revelation, but we're not, where we, we're not in our passage today, okay? Um, what, I, I, one of the things, obviously, my objective... My objective is to, to, to share with you hermeneutics, which, by the way, hermeneutics is just a big, fancy seminary term that means this. It's all this means. It means the proper methods of reading Scripture, okay? So, so let me give an example of this, okay? So, like, some, some people say, some people go, okay, all you got to do is, is, is flip the page, stick your finger down there, and, and start reading, Okay? And yes, can God speak to you that way? Yes, yes. But this reminds me, and I've done this before with you all, but some of you are new. So it reminds me of that story where the, where the person, would ask, they were like, God, I need you to talk to me. And they open it up and they stick their finger down there and they come to the passage where it says, and Judas went and hung himself. And the person was like, well, that's not very encouraging. Okay, let, me, let me try another location. And, and he does it and, it and he gets to a spot and he goes, Go and do likewise. <laughs> and the person was like, oh, this is really, this is really bad. And so they flip the thing again. They flip it one more time. And then it comes, what you do, do quickly. <laughs> so, so you understand, this is, this is not the way that we read Scripture. The other, the other thing that we do is you have to read Scripture within its context. And my biggest argument that I have had regarding those who hold to a pre-tribulation rapture is you are not reading. You have to make things happen in locations. If you just read Matthew 24 in its, in its, its progressive state, you then parallel that to uh, Revelation chapter 5. They are the same story. They are the exact same story. So my whole point is, is you got to read them that way and, and using hermeneutical principles. And so what you can't do is, is jump from th something here and take something there and kind of, oh, well, let me piecemeal this and piecemeal that. You read the text in its context. So read the text in its context, and that's how you start to figure out what the Scriptures are saying about things, okay? So one of the things I've done is I've, I've, I've gone out, because some of you all are, some of you all are just like, you are you're emotionally charged and dogmatic about this. Now, but now let me say this. Let me say this. I absolutely 100% believe that what I'm teaching is correct. At the exact same time, at the exact same time, is it possible that I'm wrong? Yes. Yes, it is. It is highly possible that I'm wrong. Why is that? Because the fact that you are looking at events that are in the future that only one knows. And that's the Lord God, okay? So he can do what he wants to do. So, so that's where there was a Christian comedian once. In fact, Mike, Mike Williams actually referenced him. His name was Mike Warnke in the 80s. He goes, I'm a, I'm a pan-millennialist. It's just going to pan out however, I think, however God wants it to be, all right? And, and so that's really, all of us need to be pan-millennialist, okay? Now, there are reasons why people hold to a pre-trib. There's reasons people hold to a mid-trib. There's reasons people hold to a post-trib. And there's reasons why people like me hold to a pre-wrath perspective. 
All right. And there's biblical arguments for it all. But one of the things I've done is I've gone out and I've talked to several of you and stuff to hear you all share with me your defenses as I preach through this as to why you're still holding on to pre-tribulation. And a couple weeks back, I, I shared with you that, that one, of the indiv uh, one individual I was talking to said, well, it's because of the fact that the elect in Matthew 24 is always referencing Israel. And so I took you all through the entire New Testament and showed you, no, the elect is actually in the New Testament, it's the church. Okay. So then I, I went back to the same person. I was like, okay, hey, now what do you think? Now I've shared about the elect. And they said, the passage still says those in Judah must flee. So... So, so, so I'm going to, I'm going to go there just very briefly, Matthew chapter 24, and let me read it for you. And then let me show you. Okay. Yeah, it's nice. Matthew 24. So it starts there, Matthew 24, starting in verse 15, it says this, and by the way, the words will not be on the screen and you can just write it down, go look it up later. It says, therefore, when you see this ab uh, ab abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountain. And then he goes into this, whoever's on the housetop must not go down to, the, to get, get things out of the house. Whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies those days. Uh, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as had not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will be. And, I, and, and my whole argumentation is that the church and, and is going through this because what the whole preceding of Matthew 24 is the disciples say, what is the sign of the end of the age? What is the sign of the return? What, so, what is the sign that you're coming back? And the sign was these cosmic disturbances and then Jesus in the sky with the trumpet blast and then those in Christ are raised, okay? So the person said to me, no, see, this, it says it's Judah. It's Judah. Now, I want you just to think just for a moment. Just think. Where is the abomination of, je of, of desolation? Where does it occur? It occurs where? <laughs> Judah. It occurs in Jerusalem, Okay. So now, now I just want you to take world history, just world history events. If, let's say when Hitler decides he's going to start World War II and he invades Poland, where do you think the most initial devastation is going to happen? Where he launches his initial attack, right? Or when Alexander the Great decides, hey, I'm going to take over this entire uh, area east of, of Greece what, what, everywhere he hits, that's now the focus point in all of the energy because it's the closest area of battle, okay? The moment that the, that the peace treaty is broken, remember, the, the Antichrist is going to have a peace treaty with Israel for three and a half years, and the entire world system's going to be at peace during that three and a half years that we even as the church are involved in. But at three and a half years, the Antichrist breaks that priest treaty, sits down on the abomination of desolation, and says, here we go, boys. And that's when the fifth seal is broken and the martyrs happen. Well, where do you think he's starting from? He's in the seat of power at Jerusalem in Judea. So who do you think needs to get out of job, dodge the fastest? Those right there. So that's why he's sitting there saying, as soon as you see the abomination, you better go because the stormtroopers are coming. You better start running. That's why it says Judea. Not because this is saying that this is about Israel. It's saying it's because this is the seat of power. Okay? Now, that's just a little side note. Now, let's get to where we are. We are in Revelation 9. We are in Revelation 9. We've already had the rapture of the church there at the sixth seal. We've already had the interlude where the sealing of the Israelites, the 144,000, which when we get to chapter 14, we found out they're going to be the first fruits. And I told you, I believe that you do not see Gentiles being saved after the resurrection of the church. Now, I could be wrong, but all the indication is, is that those who are sealed are sealed with the name of Yahweh way and the name of the Messiah. There's no Holy Spirit, but yet the church is sealed with the 
Holy Spirit is what Ephesians tells us. So this is part of the reason why I think that those who are going to be saved during the, during the wrath of God, during the day of the Lord, those that are going to be saved are only going to be Israelites. But they're sealed. Then there's this worship service that we indicated that is actually the church. It's the multitudes. It's the multitudes upon multitudes who come out of the tribulation, and they are there worshiping God. And then we start what is the seventh seal, which is the seven trumpets. And we began looking at that last week, and this is the wrath of God. This is the day of the Lord. This is somewhere in the second half of the seven and a half year period of time. So you got three and a half years, you got the great tribulation that's going to last probably about a year and a half, and then you probably got about another year and a half of this period of the day of the Lord, of the wrath of God, okay? And that's, what's, that's where we are. And so last week, we looked at the fact that we live in this world that is full of injustices. That's what we talked about. I mean, all of us have experienced an injustice of some sort at some time. Every single one of us have. So how then is God going to reconcile the injustices of this world? That is what this is about. Remember, this is, I, I mentioned to you last time that this is the kinsman redeemer. This is the whole picture of the story of Ruth in the Old Testament. A kinsman redeemer was where the close relative would buy back the, 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 the land, if you will, the property, if you will, of a deceased relative and then give it back to their lineage. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, we lost that which was rightly ours. And so the son, the kinsman redeemer, the close relative had to buy it back. And Jesus bought it back in his death, burial, and resurrection. He proved his victory over sin and death. Because we are all, we, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Every one of us in our trespasses and sin were slaves to sin. And because of that, there was no way we could escape our own demise. And so God, knowing that we were destined to the lake of fire forever and ever, said, I will make a way. I will send my son, and he will pay the price, which is why he uses that economic term when he breathes his last. Right before he does it, he says the words, to telestai, which is an economic ledger term, which means paid in full. So the penalty payment is now paid by Christ so that anyone, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord Jesus, they will be saved. And now they are covered by the blood of the Lamb. Their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And they are going to be spared the wrath of God. Because that's what Thessalonians tells us, is that the church was not appointed for wrath. But we're going to be spared from wrath, which is about to be poured out. So this is the kinsman redeemer has bought us back. But a kinsman redeemer, it wasn't just that they had the economic capacity to buy one back, but squatters would move into the land. And it was the responsibility of the kinsman redeemer to remove the squatters from the land to make it actually habitable and useful for the rightful heirs. Well, as soon as Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin permeated the world. And this is the reason why we have sickness and disease. This is why we have death. This is why we have wars. This is why we have family strife. This is why we have divorce. This is why we have um, uh, uh, sexual addictions and, and rampant promiscuity in this world. This is why we have uh, uh, gender dysphoria that goes on throughout our society. It is all because of the fact that there are squatters in the land and it needs to be purged. And so Jesus, not only does he have the, 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 the wealth to buy us back with his death, but he also has the power to purge the earth. And that is what the wrath, the day of the Lord is all about. And so what we looked at last time was we looked at how we had the judgment on the earth itself. We had the judgment on, because humanity has corrupted the earth. I mean, ever heard of greening? That's just a byproduct of everything that we as humanity have done in our sin nature that's created all that kind of stuff that then has progressed. 
that now the natural world is on its own doing its crazy stuff. I mean, was it just, not just this week that we had the earliest Cat 5 hurricane that's ever hit, right? <laughs> what? In July? It's nuts because the world is moaning and groaning for its day of redemption. So the earth, the land, the land has been corrupted and God judges it. Then the oceans have been corrupted because of us. Think about how many um, oil spills that have happened and all these other kinds of things that we've done. So the, o- the, the ocean has been corrupted by man and now it's purged there with the second trumpet. Then we saw the fresh water, the springs. We have also corrupted those. And so God judges that. And then finally it was the skies and the cosmos. And God then purges that. But then at the end, end of what we looked at last week was, whoa, whoa, whoa. And we saw that even with the seals, the first four seals of those four trumpets. I mean, of of the four horsemen, it's, you know, Erechimai, come and go and go quickly. You all are doing your wrath of, of the Antichrist. Go do your work. But then, then the fifth seal comes and it's the martyrs. The sixth seal comes and it's this cosmic disturbance of the return of Christ. Then the seventh seal is the wrath of God. In other words, the first four were bad, but the next three are even worse. The first four trumpets are bad, but the next three are so bad that they're known as woes. Woe! Oh, you think it's bad. You haven't got a clue how bad it's going to get. And so that is what leads us. All that's been prefaced to this point is the kinsman redeemer is now purchasing in, uh, in the land and has, has re- is removing the squatters. And we've looked at how he's attacked all. He's purged all of the world. But now today with the first woe of God's judgment, that's your sermon title, the first woe of God's judgment, it is now directly pointed to humanity. Humanity is now about to experience some of this purging. So let's, let, let me go to the Father for just a moment in prayer before we actually start looking at these verses. And we're going to look at them verse by verse. I'm not going to read them in their entirety because of the sake of time. So, Father, we do come into your presence and we humble ourselves before you. And we do recognize, Father, whether I'm right, whether pre-tribbers are right, whether mid-tribbers are right, whether post-tribbers are right, Father, what we do know and what we all can agree upon is that your son, Jesus, is coming back and he is the kinsman redeemer and he is going to purge the world and he is going to make it right. He is just as the earth moans and groans for its day of redemption. We also, we cry out, Maranoth, the Lord, come, come quickly. We are crying out with the same kind of expression, saying, Jesus, we need you. We desperately need you. We see the ramifications and the effects of this sinful world. And we know that we need to be bold and courageous in our faith and to stand firm and declare unequivocally and, and, and with righteousness and with holiness that you are God and there is no other. That it is in Christ and Christ alone that we are born again. It is in Christ and Christ alone that salvation is found. And no other name is one saved but the name of Jesus. And so, Father, I pray that over these next few moments as we look at these scriptures, that you make them come alive, that your Holy Spirit be the teacher of everything that we have to say and grow us and mold us into the image of your son, Jesus. And it is in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So if you are taking notes in your listening guide this morning, your very first point is this, is that everything and everyone, everything and everyone answers to God. Everything and everyone answers to God. Look with me at verse 1. Then the fifth trumpet sounded. This is the first woe, the fifth trumpet. And I saw a star from heaven. Now listen to the verb tense, which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. Now here, well, I'm going to share with you later on when we get a little further, I'm going to uh, clarify, but this individual, this fallen star that had fallen and is now hit the earth, that is Lucifer. That is Satan. And he is then going to be given at this moment. In other words, he's already on the earth. 
He is already actively doing what he does, and he has been since the garden when Adam and Eve sinned, and he's been vile and vicious and malicious and horrific and terrifying and all that he does. He is the prince and the power of this world. He is vile. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against him and his demonic horde. That is our battle. And he has been roaming to and fro the earth since the time of Adam and Eve. We see him showing up with the time of Job. We see him there with Abraham. We see him there with Moses. We see him there with David. We see him there through the exiles. We see him there at the point of Christ, even with Herod trying to kill the Messiah. And he has then, as when we get to chapter 12 and 13, we're going to see he has also come after us, the church. Because he despises us most of all. He despises all of God's creation, but of us, we are the most hated by Satan. Because we know the truth, and we have surrendered to Christ Jesus. And during this time, when this angel, this fifth angel, blasts the trumpet, he then, in the blast of the trumpet, gives this key to Satan. Satan has not had the key up to this point. But now he has been given this key to this abyss. And my point, when I say everything and everyone answers to God, is because even take Satan and go back to the book of Job for a moment. When Satan is roaming to and fro, what does the book of Job tell us? God summoned the angels. And who then shows up? Lucifer, a fallen angel shows up to the court of God. Why? Because God summoned him. When God says, come, Satan says, yes, sir. Then God is the one who initiates the conversation with Satan regarding Job. And he says, is there anyone righteous like Job on the earth? And Satan's like, the only reason he's righteous and serves you is because you've protected him because he's had this hedge of protection. And God's like, all right, you can remove the hedge of protection and you can destroy anything around him, but you can't touch him. And that very day, all of, all of um, Job's wealth is destroyed. His children, all 10 of his kids are destroyed. All of his livestock are, are destroyed or are, are stolen. Everything that he has is wiped out. And all that is left is him and his bride. And then, then, in the midst of that, Job worships God. So we, there's this period of time, we don't know exactly how long it is, but all of a sudden we go to chapter 2 of Job and God summons the angels and guess who has to show up? Satan, Lucifer, has to show up and he does. And once again, God initiates the conversation, hey, have you considered my servant Job? Hey, the only reason he is still worshiping you is you haven't afflicted him. So God says, fine, you can afflict him, but you can't kill him. So that's when the boils and all the, the stuff comes upon him and he starts to waste away. And yet, what does he do? Even when his wife says, just curse God and die, what does he do? He says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He doesn't sin in that moment. But Satan can only do what is permitted to him or allowed to him. Now, he's been given a great deal of latitude because at the fall, God did, uh, man, excuse me, humanity basically gave up their authority and did give it to Satan, which is why he is known as the prince and the power of this world, this age, this heir. But when, Satan, when Jesus died on the cross, what did he say in Matthew 28? All authority has been given to me. In other words, Jesus took back what Satan robbed us from, and now he is saying, you, the church, you live and exercise your life under the authority that I have. And you are no longer subject to that influence of the adversary, okay? But the adversary still goes around and still is wreaking havoc in this world, but he still has to respond and obey the commands of the Father. And that's why I say everything and everyone answers to God. And now this key is given to him of this bottomless pit, okay? Having said that, what you need to understand, Satan has been longing for this day. Satan has been excited for this moment. 
Because you have to keep in mind, Satan actually still believes he's going to win. He is so deluded that he actually thinks that even though he had his first rebellion eons ago, he thinks he's going to still win the ultimate battle. He's that deluded. He's that twisted. And what he thinks is that his, his special force unit has been imprisoned, and as soon as they get unleashed, the special force unit is going to just devastate the world, and he's going to win. That's what Lucifer actually thinks. And so when this moment happens, when the trump is given and the key to the abyss is now handed to him, Lucifer's like, game on, let's go get him. And that leads us to our second point, because what happens is he puts that key into that lock, he unlocks it, and your second point is that pure evil is unleashed. Let me emphasize here, when I say that pure evil is unleashed, let me emphasize, praise the Lord God that the church is spared from the wrath of God. Praise the Lord God that those who are sealed are not going to be impacted by this group of unleashed evil demons. Look with me at verses 2 and 3. So it starts there in verse 2. He says, He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. One of the things I do want to emphasize is this ninth chapter uses the phrase like or as more than any chapter in the book of Revelation. You have to keep in mind that John is writing this perspective and he's trying to communicate in first century language the best that he can with the language that he has, what he is seeing. And so as a result, when he sees this particular moment happen, he uses like and as, like and as, and as we read through it, you're going to hear it over and over and over again, like and as, because he doesn't have the words to describe how horrific this demonic horde actually is. He, he, he referenced here that there's this, as this, uh, soon as he opens it, there's this, this smoke as of a great furnace that comes out. This, this place has been a place of torment to these demons. It is, if you will, like hell and what will ultimately be like the lake of fire. It has not been a summer camp or a picnic retreat. They're not on holiday waiting for this moment. They have been in torturous moment, and this smoke of this fire, if you will, bursts forth when the gate is opened, and they come out, and they are, if you will, mutated. They are now, he says, they are as locusts. They came as locusts upon the earth, and this is referencing quantity as well as quantity, quality and quantity of what they are. So it's a large number and they are perverse. Now, when I say that, we're going to talk a little bit more about those, who those might actually be and what some believe they are here in just a second. The point that I'm driving at though is that this evil has been unleashed and it is now upon the earth and it is putrid. It is vile. And they have this power of this scorpions to harm, to harm those on the earth. They've been given this power. Which now leads us to the third point. Who is it that they are going to, if you will, punish? This is your third point is that corrupted, corrupted humanity is now judged. Corrupted humanity is judged. And it is a judgment we do not want. And again, praise Jesus. Praise Jesus that those who are in the church do not experience this. This is the reason why we must know for certain that we are indeed His. 
You cannot tell me about your baptismal experience. You cannot tell me about the moment you prayed with the preacher. You can't tell me. You have got to tell me you know relationally the Lord Jesus Christ. You either know that you know that you know or you don't know. And if you do not have the assurance of the Holy Spirit's conviction of your heart that you are here, His, then I'm telling you today is the day of salvation and you need during the invitation to stand up, come down here and say, Scott, I don't know and I need Jesus. Because if you don't, this is your future. And you do not want this. Because now corrupted humanity is judged. Look with me at verses 4 through 6. Look at how, what these, these demonic whores who are as scorpions do to the earth. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth. Remember, a third of the earth was destroyed. Now there's this, these pockets of grass left, and he's told, hey, don't, don't harm the green things. Don't harm the green things, nor any green thing. Uh, not Oh, excuse me, but only the men, but only the men who have, 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 uh, who have not, excuse me, who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were permitted to kill anyone. God, my goodness, I can't read. But they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die and death flees from them. So, this judgment on humanity has now been unleashed, and it is a painful judgment. And again, who has spared this in this moment? Who has spared this? The ones that are spared is the actual planet itself. Because what do locusts do? Real life locusts, what do they do? They devastate every kind of plant life there is. Remember, that was one of the plagues of, of Israel and it, uh, that upon Egypt, one of the plagues of Israel upon Egypt. And those plagues devastated the crops of the Egyptians, but none were touched in Israel, in Goshen. Well, he's sitting there saying, don't touch any of the green. And then he goes on and also do not touch those who have been sealed. Again, I indicate, I my perspective is that is the, the people of Israel who have come to know the Lord God. In other words, they've come to recognize that Yeshua Yamashiach, Jesus the Messiah, is indeed their Messiah. Because one, they've seen him in the sky, and all of a sudden the church is gone, and then they're like, we messed up. <laughs> and remember, remember Romans chapter 11, part of the reason I said it was because of us, it was, it was because of the Gentiles that the Israelites didn't realize their need for the Messiah. And I think that's what's happening here. So now they are the first fruit, 144,000. They're the first fruit. So there are others who are going to be saved. I think they're Israelites. They're going to be saved because you've got this. We're not there yet. There's going to be this angelic witness. There's going to be these two witnesses. And you've got this 144,000 witnesses and anyone else that comes to know the Lord because of them. And so they're out there and they're told these, these demonic hordes are told, do not touch them at all but you afflict everybody else. Now, I realize it says the word men, and you ladies are sitting there going, about time, they get it. This is that, this is that pejorative men. This is everybody. Women, you are not spared this. Men, women, all who are of, of a, a mind of accountability that have been left behind are going to experience this, this judgment. And what is this judgment? They are being punished, tortured, tortured with these, these demonic hordes that when they touch them, when they afflict them, it says that it's as if they were touched like by a scorpion and they will not die, but they feel all the effects of the poison in their system. Now, beloved, I don't have a clue. I cannot visualize that. I cannot, I mean, I know how bad things are just when I watch people that battle cancer or when I watch people battle different sicknesses and I see how the human body can shrivel up and yet this is going to be far worse. Whatever image you think you can imagine, this is worse. 
this is worse. To such an extent that these people try to kill themselves, but they're not permitted to die. And we know, remember, this is the day of the Lord. And I've told you, I think the day of the Lord is going to be a year, year and a half. It's, it's that second half of Daniel's 70th week that we have not even, you know, that's this part for you Bible nerds, go study. If you don't know what that is, go look it up, but not on the internet. Go talk to somebody. Okay. Uh, but that 70th week is there. And this is that latter half. And we don't know how long it is, but we know at least it's five months. Because this particular trumpet is five months. Five months of absolute, utter pain to the point you are wanting to die and you can't. Beloved, I'm telling you, we do not want our worst enemies to go through this. You may think you want your worst enemy to go through this, but you do not which is why we need to be intentional, why we need to be bold, why we need to be proclaimers of the truth of the gospel. Let us be about that. So that's your, fifth, your fourth point. The fourth point is that for five months of unrestrained torture was given to Satan. Five months of unrestrained torture was given to Satan. And we've already read it, but I'm going to read it a second time because John wants us to understand. He says it twice. He's saying it two times for effect. Five months, five months, almost a half a year of inexplicable pain and torture. Starting there in verse 7, going to, the, to verse 12. So the appearance of the locust was, was like horses prepared for battle. Again, like, like. And on their heads uh, appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Again, this is why we're, the, we're trying to describe these demonic things. So they're, they're, they're like horses, but their faces like a men and angels. They masquerade as men, even. even. Even good angels, we are told in Hebrew, sometimes we entertain angels unaware. So these angels have this kind of appearance. They've got this face like a man, but yet they, these angels were so perverse that they've now become demonic, and now they've got these, these deformed bodies because of their corruption. And, and their head appears to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men, and they had a hair like the hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. In other words, the... This, Hollywood has been doing a pretty good job, but whatever Hollywood has created, it's still lacking. It's still lacking. These teeth, these lion teeth, in other words, they, can, they, they, they rip, they devour, but yet no one can die. Keeps going, verse 9. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots and many horses rushing to battle. Th this is where, where some of you who are old enough, you might remember in the 70s, you had a guy named Hal Elrod, or I think it was his name or something like that. And he wrote a book, um, The Great Awakening or something of that nature. My mind has gone blank for this for the second. But he, he describes this and he says, these are helicopters. Let me tell you, demons are not helicopters. Demons are far worse than helicopters. John is trying to describe to us what this is, these demonic hordes are. And what he's saying, when he's saying their, their chest is like iron, he's, he's basically saying they are indestructible. Because I have a strong suspicion that the humanity that is left, because of our resilience for life, they probably try to figure out a way to defeat them. And everything we do, it's like shooting nuclear missiles at Godzilla. It just bounces off and does nothing. It does nothing. There's no impact upon these, these horrific, demonic creatures, okay? And that's all he's trying to describe. So then verse 10, so they have, uh, they have tails like scorpions and sting, and in their tail is the power to hurt men for five months. Again, that second time. And again, this is hurting men. This is pain. This is torture. This is preparing humanity for what is ultimately to come, which is the lake of fire. And it's basically saying, you thought it was bad now, because everything that Jesus has been doing in this entire process is, you thought that was bad, wait till you see this. You thought those trumpets were bad, wait till you see this. You think this five months of torture was bad, wait till the lake of fire. Everything God has done has been showing the preamble. He's been giving us the, the preview to the movie in every single one of these events. 
And this five months is the preview to the destiny of these who are destined to the lake of fire. Keeps going. Verse 11. They have as king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek his name is Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still coming after these things. Abaddon and Apollyon, what that literally means, it literally means destroyer. That's what it means. In Greek and Hebrew, it's the same word for the word destroyer. And I've already shared with you, I believe that the, who that is, who the destroyer is, is Lucifer, is Satan. And he is this angel because that is, beloved, make no doubts about it. Remember, he was an archangel of God. That is what he is. He is an angelic being. But when he fell, and we already read that back in verse 1, which had fallen to the earth, when he fell, he lost his status as an angel and became demonic in nature. And that is why it is right to call him a demon. But yet he is still an angel. And so the language is still communicated. And so here we are told this king over them, the angel of the abyss, this one who had the key, who unlocked it and unleashed them. His name is Abaddon uh, in, the, in Hebrew and in Apollyon in Greek. And he is the destroyer. He is the destroyer. Now, let me just make one side reference here uh, uh, before we, we wrap this up. As to who, why, why are these demons locked up? Here's the short end of the answer. I don't fully know what they did. I don't, I don't know. What I know is that this particular set of demons that are locked up were so bad that God said they can't, they cannot have access to the earth right now. Now some, now some would tell you that this goes all the way back to the book of Genesis. When the, the sons of God had relations with the daughters of men. And they say that this was these demonic hordes actually having relationships with women, and that's where the, the Nephilim came, okay? These, these giants of the day. I'll tell you the reason I don't believe that. The reason I don't think that that is the case is because these guys are locked up. These guys are locked up. And yet we're told that after the flood that the Nephilim still walked the earth. So if these guys got locked up and literally all of creation was destroyed, how did the Nephilim survive? There's a problem. So what I think what you're looking at is actually you're looking at two different lines. I think what you're looking at when it says the sons of God, I think you're looking at the line of Seth, which runs through Noah, and the daughters of men are everybody else. Abel and all the other lines. And that, that line, it's still out of Adam. And so when it says there, the Nephilim survived, though, that is those of, of Seth through Noah. And then they are the ones who permeate the world. Okay? That's what I believe. Now, to those who hold that, the, that that was actually a, 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 a relational sexual thing between this, these fallen demons and that, part of the reason why they say it is because in the book of Jude, in Jude chapter 6, in Jude, there's only one chapter in Jude. There's only one chapter in the book of Jude. So Jude verse 6. In Jude verse 6, it, it says these words. It says, And angels who had not kept their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. That is this what we just now read about. That is the great day. Now, the reason why they say that this is a sexual perversion is because of the next verse. Verse 7, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as examples in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. So what, what they, those who argue that these are that, 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 that the Nephilim are these children of these demonic angels who had sexual relations with humanity, and that that's why they are there, is because of this, because he says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah, which is known for its sexual perversion, and because it references it. So, the, so quite frankly, is this a possibility? Yes. 
Yes, it is. But then what do you do with the Nephilim who existed afterwards? You've got to answer that. And I don't know how, I don't know how you answer that part of it. Okay. But if you want to hold that, that's what these, that, that these are, this is a sexually perverted demon and that's why it's locked up. Go ahead. If you want to just say, Hey, they, they did something. Somehow they left their natural state to such an extent, just as Sodom and Gomorrah left its natural state, that that was their punishment, why they got locked up. Then, then that's good too. Because I don't know what it is, but I know it was so bad they got locked up. And it could be either one, something so perverse that they got locked up or this actual sexual thing and they got locked up for that. I don't know. I don't know. But my, 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 I have to present to you the whole context of Scripture, and I have to give it both ways to you, okay? And this is where we are. So the second woe has now ended. And so what does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? Well, how do we apply this truth to us? Well, here's how you apply it. This is your application point. You, you in Christ, you who are in Christ have no need to fear Satan. You in Christ have no need to fear Satan. And that even goes for these Jews who come to know the Lord after the resurrection of the church. Those who have been sealed cannot be touched by these demonic hordes that come upon them. We have no need to fear Satan. Well, the problem is, is most of us walk around as if he's the boogeyman and we are just scared little children. We do not understand who we are. And I'm telling you, rise up. Rise up and be bold for Jesus. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this opportunity. We have come to hear these words out of Revelation 9. And Father, this is a horrific moment of the first woe of this judgment on man. We've seen the judgment on, on earth. We have seen the judgment on, on the oceans. We've seen the judgment on the rivers. We've seen the judgment on the skies. And now, Father, we start to see the judgment on humanity itself. And Father, it is vile. It is wicked. It is horrible. And Father, we are not told the day nor the hour. We are just told it is coming. And for those who are lost, it is as a thief in the night, but we are children of the light. And so we get to see the evidence of the things happening to point to those things as they are about to occur and say, oh my goodness, it is getting closer and closer. And Father, we see evidences that it is getting closer. And the earth is groaning and we in Christ are crying out Maranatha and we're saying, Lord, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done, Lord God. And Father, I'm praying that you would awaken us and Father, it, that we would be bold in our defense of our hope that we have in you. And Father, I pray that there's anyone here this morning who does not have a relationship with you, that today is the day they will stand up and walk these aisles and say, Scott, I need to know Christ. I need to know Jesus. I don't want to be tortured like that. I don't want to go to the lake of hell, lake of fire. And if there's anyone watching online, Father, I pray they would write in the comments, allow us to follow up with them. That we might be able to share with them the truth of the gospel. All to your glory. Father, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah.